um, both of them are very irrepressible, so I'm going to speak really fast. Um, in case you don't know these facts about them, um, the peerless Marjan Satrapi, filmmaker, illustrator, graphic novelist, and children's book author, was born in Iran and lives and works in Paris. She combines political history and memoir in her debut feature animated film, Persepolis, an autobiographically based coming of age story that begins during the Islamic Revolution and is told through her adventures as a young Iranian girl. It premiered in Cannes in 2007. Her most recent film, Chicken with Plums, which you will see tonight, tells the story of her great uncle Nasser Ali Khan, a renowned musician, and it made its New York debut just a few weeks ago at the Tribeca Film Festival. Um, each of these films began first as a graphic, no graphic novel. Um, this is something she holds in common with Françoise Mouly, born in Paris and living in New York since the 1970s. She has been the art editor of The New Yorker since 1993, where she has overseen over 900 daring, innovative New York covers. I hope, I, I hope I'm right with that number. Um, she launched Raw, the large format magazine of comics, graphics, and illustrated texts, and co-edited with Art Spiegelman from 1980 to 1991, um, co-edited co the magazine. She is also the founder of Toon Books, um, a collection of hardcover comics for emerging readers, which she started in 2008. And she's considered by many to be the most important comics editor of the last 30 years. So without further ado, Give, yep, that's working now. Yes, now. Does work? Ah, oh, it came on. Okay. Such a pleasure to be here because I get to see Marjan. Um, otherwise, she's so busy, um, just whizzes in and out. In your new incarnation, Marjan, as the metteuse en scène d'un film. When we met, I don't know if you remember, but do you remember when we met? It, Absolutely. It was a book convention. Yes, in LA and we got lost in the street because we didn't understand it was the blocks they were far right. bigger than we, the we were blocks in New York and we were scared that something bad would happen to us. Yes. I remember it when Yeah, uh, Marjan coming from Paris and me coming from New York, we meet in the convention center, the Staples Convention Center in, uh, in LA, and we say, let's go out for a cup of coffee and a cigarette, ha <laughs> ha, in LA. <laughs> and then we start walking down the street and like 15 minutes later, there's still not a street and not a place to have coffee and no place to smoke. But at the time you had books coming out. So how does it go from being, even at the time, a lot of what we talked about is how you got to do graphic novels and then now, uh, after that, I also want to hear you talk about how you move from one medium of graphic novels to films. But first, what ever brought you to doing comics or graphic novels? Well, first of all, I have to say how impressed I am to be here, sitting just here. Because one day I was an art student, and from far I was hearing MoMA, 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 but you know, Today I had my MoMA day, you know, two, uh, two films, and here I'm sitting at the MoMA talking, so I'm really, really very impressed. I am like the art student that I used to be, so uh, it's, it's not easy. Uh, but uh, actually, uh, the, the reason actually that I started making comics or graphic novels was uh, because of our Spiegelman, because <laughs> your husband. <laughs> so, because of course, you know, like everybody else who does not know anything about this, uh, this media, because this is what it is, it's not a genre, but it's really a way of expressing, uh, you know, like everybody else, I had uh, this idea about what a comic was. That, that means that was reading 
for children or adolescent or retarded adult. That is what is what the majority of people think. You grew up in Iran, so there were no comics. No, that was comics, but that was really Tintin and Asterix. That was not the kind of thing that you know I could be attracted to because that was no female character. That, that, that it was not really you know Children's my cousins. Literature. Yes, mm -hmm. my cousins they would read it a lot, but not me. So you know I had this general idea that everybody else had, and you know then I came to France and my for the first birthday that I was celebrating there, and I was 24 by then, uh, they, uh, they offered me mouse. And I really didn't know what to expect. I, I, I didn't know the book. And I started reading it, and it was really like, like the biggest revelation in my life, because suddenly I said, my god, this story is said in this form. So you know, it was really something that was stuck in my head, because I'm somebody who thinks with image, who uh, you know, image is part of my narration as it is in, 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 in graphic novels. That means that uh, it's not unlike the illustration where you write something and then you make an illustration. Uh, but in, in graphic novels, actually, whatever you don't write, you draw, and whatever you write, you don't draw. So it's a really specific language. So having had somebody had done that, it was not right away that I started uh, writing the books that I wrote because uh, I think I needed some time also to cool down to understand what happened to us. Uh, I and, and in art school, uh, you were in art school uh, for how long? But I was in art school for three, I mean, I was in art school forever. At first I made art school four years in France and then to be able to get a French visa, I had to be a student again. So I made another art school for another three years, which <laughs> <laughs> which was which was good because you know that was so many things that we were not able to make uh, in Iran, for example, you know, to draw nudes. It was impossible, mm -hmm. you know, or you know that was many things that we didn't have. We, we had also well, a lot. You you did go back to Tehran at some point, and, at, and there did you also try to go to an art school yes. there? Yes. And how did they deal with life drawing and drawing from nudes? I mean, actually... It was, uh, well, uh, you know, that was no drawing of the nude, as you can imagine, under the Islamic Republic. So, uh, at one point, you know, we had these models that was, you know, that was us, but all of us, we were covered by very, you know, like big manteau and, you know, the scarf and, the, and you know, like when you say anatomy, you have to have to see the body movement. I mean, if you have <laughs> tissue everywhere, then you uh, draw drape, and you don't draw a human being. You, you got really good really at the good cloth. At the, yes, yeah. at the cloth, at the tissue, <laughs> all this the fabric, and we were very, very good. So at one point we asked, so if the boys, they could see it because they were dressed, but at least we could see, you know, how the knee was oh, bending. Oh, that's interesting. And one day, that was a friend of us, actually, who was sitting, and we were drawing him, and one of these guardians of the revolution of our art school came, and I was drawing him, and I say, don't look at him. Why are you looking at him? And I was like, I'm drawing him. And he was like, no, you cannot look at him. And I was like, so am I supposed to look at the door and draw him? And he said, yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> He was he was a guardian of the revolution. That was also your yeah, art that, teacher. No, no, he oh. was you know in the in the university you had these guys that were there you know for the discipline they called them. So you know they told us you know put your veil down for you put your veil up. Why do you talk with that one? Go from these stairs. Don't walk there. There in art school. You yes. mean in college? Yes, of course. I mean, it was just completely ridiculous. Like we had like two uh, stairways, and was, one stairway was for, for girls, and the other stairway was for boys. But then we went up, and up we were all mixed. So we <laughs> <laughs> the whole point with the, with the stairway. So you know, and it is not because something is forbidden mm -hmm. that you won't make it. Of course, you know, later on we when we started knowing each other, you know, then we 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 gathered in each other's house, and you know, we draw each other. So, but. And also our teachers, they were not like, uh, they, our teachers, they were very good teachers. So, you know, then we could go later on to the studio of our teachers to work with them, you know, but with in no a more of yeah. a private mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. So it, is, it does not mean, you know, I learned a lot actually being in Iran because also since it was so many, many things that were forbidden, we had this thirst to know, to, we had this thirst to try to... You know, that's, that's worth trying on American students to try to, for, to tell them to look at the door while they're drawing somebody. I, I, absolutely. I mean, maybe then they would be interested in the freedom that they have to actually look at the exactly. subject but and draw whatever they want. But it made us really thirsty to, to really to try and, right. and all of that. Mm -hmm. So, But when I came to France, it was good because I think like, in general, I think that art school is really useless because like, you know, 
you know, the thing that you have to learn, you will never learn it uh, studying mm -hmm. there. Everything that you have to know, you just know it by experience later in life. But it's a good moment where you can try things and, you know, to go, to go try different techniques, etc. And at the time that actually I was doing that, I was absolutely not thinking, you know, that one day I would make, you know, graphic novels, that I would make cinema. None of that I, I knew. I knew that I wanted to draw. I knew that I wanted to write. I had a vague idea. Like, always I have a vague idea about everything. And then, um, you know... And then, you know, I came to Paris and then nobody wanted my drawings and uh, it's true. And at one point I, I really said to myself, this is maybe I'm really not good at it. So I tried to find other jobs and uh, it didn't work neither. What did you try? Uh, well, uh, first, I, you I, first I wanted to become a private detective. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I think with your knack for being inconspicuous, that would have been like the perfect choice for you. Um, yes. and. Uh, but then, you know, the private detective, you just have to go and find the women that are cheating at their husband and the <laughs> vice versa. And, you know, ethically, it was a problem for me. You know, like, I, why would I follow somebody who is, like, sleeping with somebody else out of my business? So that didn't work. <laughs> Then since I was depressed, I was sitting, the, I was watching this series that was, that was called uh, The Headhunter, no, uh, no, something other, Hunter with Lee Major. Mm -hmm. But then uh, I saw this ad in the, in the magazine, and they was asking for Headhunter. That, that is somebody who takes, you know, like uh, the CEO of one company for another company. Mm -hmm. But I thought that it was a job, you know, that they would, they would give me gun and I would just, you know, like <laughs> chase them. You know? So I swear it's true, you know, I bought, you know, all this thing, you know, with the pants with lots of pockets and, you know, I had caterpillar <laughs> shoes. And there I go. And that Again, is, to be inconspicuous. Yes, yeah. and, you know, and then there is all this girl sitting, you know, with tights and very nice. And I was like, these guys, they are going to be hunter like me. And so, you know. <laughs> and I went in the interview, and the lady who was making the interview, you know, I was like, on, you know, like, give me the guns. And she was like, do you know what this job is? I was like, yeah, we are going to chase the criminal. And she, and so that didn't work. And the third job that was that um, uh, I decided that I will sell a fur on the Champs Elysees, mm -hmm. but the only fur that I know is uh, mm -hmm. the fox. So they showed me furs like that, and they, so they said, do you know furs? And I was like, yeah, of course. And it was, you had to speak for European language mm -hmm. that I knew, mm -hmm. and uh, you had to have a knowledge about fur. Mm -hmm. So uh, what is this? Fox. And it was fox. So what is this? <laughs> fox. 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 <laughs> so then after that, I understood that I could not make any other work. This was the problem. So I had, and that is when I started Persepolis. And that is the way I became a cartoonist. So that's when you, that's when you became a cartoonist, because um, it's much easier than being a headhunter. But then did you expect that your book, did, were you working with a publisher? Did you, um, did you, did you have a, um, a book in mind and a venue? And did you expect that it would be as well received as... Oh, no, no, not at all. I mean, when I started, you know, to write Persepolis, believe me, I mean, I was convinced that, first of all, no publisher wants to publish it, so my goal was to make it because it was very important to me to have just one other version of the story, not the other version, but just to say, you know, uh, you know, because it, it was in a way that, you know, we had a government that really confiscated from us, you know, our identity, made mm -hmm. of us, you know, just... A population and this thing was be was believed by the other one that means suddenly we became just the terrorists our problem was only the veil and the beard and the nuclear weapon nobody remembered that you know this country had the biggest poet of the of the world and the philosopher and four thousand years of history so all of that it was just to say hey we are just human beings so that was it so i just wanted to write this book and I, I say to myself, yeah, maybe, you know, like 10, 9 people, uh, you know, I can make a Xerox and give it to them. Then, you know, the book was published, so I thought that, you know, like 300 people that really like, you know, these third world people and they have bad conscience, <laughs> they will buy my book to feel better, you know, like we did something for this poor girl. And then suddenly it became a big success, but I really, really uh, uh, don't know. 
No, you, reality, you published it in four volumes in France. Yes, it was four volumes in France. And the reason of the success, I have to say, I kept on saying I wanted to be modest, but I'm not modest in reality, so it, it's not necessary to lie. I was like, yeah, because I'm a woman, because I was in the right time, etc. I think the books are good, that's why. <laughs> that's I think, I think it's, it's absolutely uh, the reason why there was such a great success. And did you, at that time... Um, expect that um, that story would then be picked up in other countries once, uh, because France is uh, the receiving end of a lot of American culture. Anything that is a big deal and a big bestseller here makes it, will be translated in France and will actually sell well in France. But it's very rare that French books actually cross, a, a books from any other country. Uh, cross the barrier no, and I enter know. into the U.S. So how did that happen and what did that feel like? Well, it happened that, you know, that was, uh, you know, uh, Pantheon, that, uh, you know, that was this uh, great girl, Anjali Singh, who read the book in French and she was in love with the book and then, you know, she presented it to Pantheon and that at the time, you know, my publisher was Janice Gortlang, so everybody was very happy about the book and then suddenly they published it and it, it was bizarre, but, you know, it was as bizarre for me to make the book as making a film because, of course, I didn't plan neither to make films as I didn't plan to make books. And you know, now, for example, to have two films here, uh, it's a big luck because there is so few foreign films actually that come outside of America. But I have the luck to work with Michael Barker and Tom Bernard at Sony Classics, and their job is really not easy to make subtitle film coming to the U.S. is not this easy. So. I'm so really how thankful. did you go uh, into the first, and then the new movie? I mean, why, why, if you had such a success with the books that actually, like, obviously talk to people across uh, culture, why not stick with that? It's a very good question, and I still don't have the answer. <laughs> I mean, now that they, they film, they work, I can invent reason to say, yes, I wanted this and that, and there is no reason. Why would I tell a story four years in one way because it's an, you know, the language of the, of the comics has, and the language of the cinema is really two completely different languages. Just you know, the relationship that a viewer of the film or a reader of the book has with the media. You know, when you read a comic, you are always active. Between two frames, you have to imagine everything. You, know, you have to imagine the movement while you're watching a movie. At the time you're watching it, you're always passive. So already to start with that, you know, it's a complete different thing. And of course, when they proposed me to make Persepolis, you know, I was like, why should I do that? And at the same time, that was this little... little Somebody little proposed it to you. It wasn't your idea. No, it was not my idea at all. It was a friend of mine who wanted to become a producer. Is that Vincent? No, no, no. No, it's, no, uh, no somebody else. No, another, another oh, one. Okay. And so he wanted to... He said, okay, let's make that. And, you know, at the same time, I was like, why should I do that? And at the same time, that was this little Jiminy Cricket who was telling me, they're going to give you a couple of million dollars so you can make <laughs> an, a new experience. <laughs> why would you say No. And uh, I really did everything for this book, for this not to happen, because I said, okay, then we are going to make an animation in black and white, then it should be in 2D, then I want Catherine Deneuve, then it should be hand-drawn, then, <laughs> then, then, then all these things, and you know. And but, but you weren't flexible. No, no, because I didn't want to do it, so you know, I didn't. Do oh, that was worse. Uh, no, I just uh, say that that like that, they will <laughs> give up, and after one and a half months, the guy, they said, yeah, okay. And then I was like, shit, now I have to make a movie. <laughs> it was really like that, really. And I didn't know really uh, how to do it. You know, I was learning at the same time of doing it. And I think that was the fear to do really a crappy film because mm -hmm. normally the adaptation is really bad. Made by the author is really, really bad. So I was like, I have to do something. So I worked a lot. And this thing, this incredible thing happened because, you know, I'm a very solitary person. I like, you know, like every cartoon is to sit in my studio, like nobody bothers me, you know, I have my pages, I have my paper, my ink, everything, and nobody, no producer, nobody is yelling at me, no actor is fainting, nobody is crying, <laughs> everything goes fine. And suddenly, you know, I started making Persepolis, that was really difficult for me, just a simple thing, like 
Like in the morning, like when I wake up, I'm like really bad, you know, like really in a bad mood. And just I had to say hello and be nice to a hundred people. Already that was good. Right, me. because you not only like was the author, but you actually put together the team. Yes. You wanted to have hand animation. Why? I mean, there's also CGI. You give them the script, let other people figure it out. Well, because uh, because Snow White is made in 1937, <laughs> and uh, 75 years after is still a very beautiful animation. And the mm -hmm. CGI, the problem is that five years later is dated. Mm -hmm. You know, when you put three years of your life doing something, you don't want it to be dated, you know, after one year. Mm -hmm. You know, I, you, and the beauty of, uh, of the drawing by the hand, you never ever have it uh, on the computer. It's, uh, I don't like the effect. I mean, when I see it, I know it's fake. And it always something is just, I think it's a question of taste. But but you really moved mountains. I mean, I remember like being in your studio, the one that you set up in Paris. You, I mean, even when you do hand animation in France, and there are a number of um, things that are produced for the European, uh, usually TV channels, there's a few towns there outside of Paris where rent is cheap, and they give some of it to, um, uh, you know, stages to be animated. You wanted everything right there. And in the center of Paris, you set up a studio. Yeah, but the, you know, the, the reason we could make it is that we made a communist system. That means everybody was paid the same thing, including myself. Ah, okay. So that was the same salary for everyone, for the director, everybody who was play, were working. So everybody felt that they were equal and everybody gave whatever they had. Because mm -hmm. if you had this hierarchy that um, I'm the director, I have to have 10 times more than you, etc., etc., that is an alchemy that it works or not. And it was the same thing, you know, for this new film, you know, after, of course, you know, I made this first. Well, the, yes, like, again, you discovered, like, graphic novels and you gave yourself all the skills to do uh, a major work and then you tricked yourself into doing an animated movie and then I'm sure you were offered to do a second film or you were eager to do a second film, but why not use what you had so arduously set up of animation? Why switch to to yet another medium, because it's completely different, isn't it? Yes, of course, because I'm not an animator. You know, I made one mm. film in animation, and I believed that animation, just like comics, is not a genre, it's just a media. For mm. Persepolis, it was necessary to make it in animation. You know, if I put a, took a type of human being in you know, a specific geography, people, they have a lots of problem identifying themselves with somebody who does not look like them exactly, or mm. a geography that they don't know. But the abstraction of the drawing that makes that anybody can can relate to a drawing. Mm -hmm. People they can even relate to a mouse, to Mickey Mouse, to Donald Duck. Mm -hmm. That is no problem. Mm -hmm. But if it's another human being that the skin is not the same color or the geography is not mm -hmm. the same, they don't relate. So that's why I thought that it was Im important to make Persepolis in animation. And when I did that, I never thought, okay, now I'm the new Miyazaki of Europe, mm -hmm. and I have this perfect style, <laughs> and now I'm gonna make uh, 35 movies like Miyazaki, who is great. Mm -hmm. But this new film, and believe me, it was not easy, because of course, if you have made an animation in black and white that works, then everybody gives you money to make another animation in black and white that will work. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I. It was, you know, and, you know, since I had all these awards and Oscar and, you know, nominee and all of that, I said, cool, now they're giving, going to give me all the money. Easy. <laughs> Nobody, you know, they were like, why do you want to do that? I was like, well, because I want to try something new. And uh, so, so here you knew that you would, uh, I mean, you, you seem to say that like in part it's because Persepolis was your story, but here you were choosing the story of your uncle. So it wasn't quite as much. So why could you conceive of um, Poulet au Prune of Chicken with Plums with actors when you couldn't conceive because uh, Chicken with Plum, you know, it, you know, it is not a specific story, you know, of mm. a period of time of one country that you, for opening it, you have to make it more abstract. Mm. It's a love story, and a love story, this love story could happen in Paris, in Tehran, in New York, anywhere mm -hmm. in the world. So, and you know, that is the story of this man, you know, so he, you know, that remembers, so you will see the film, so I'm not gonna tell you all about it, but uh, so, you know, th the fact of being in the room and remember, you know, you, we, we had to construct a whole world uh, for him. And that happens in the 50s, and I'm such a big fan, you know, of all the Powell and Pressburger movie, and, you know, Hitchcock and Douglas Sirk, you know, all this aesthetic of the studio, and I really wanted to make a studio movie, and 
uh, so you know, and you know, in technicolor and beautiful and glamorous. This is really something that I wanted to do because you know, I thought it is okay. Now I made Persepolis. I have said whatever I knew about Iran, about what I experienced. Because more than that, I'm not a political expert. But it is also important to you know to say you know in. In 1958, in Iran, glamorous people, they fall in love. And <laughs> you know they even got sick of love. And well, I will not tell the end of the movie. But so, and, and that was also, you know, this, the, the, you know, and talk about the poetry and the beauty of, of this culture and beauty of, of the love itself. Mm -hmm. And so. And what, what did you uh, learn from the making of the movie? I mean, what was so different from um, your expectation? Is there some things that um, got to be better or worse than what you thought you would get? Really, uh, you know, animation is a long thing. So, you know, it takes, you know, have to have three years. You can change whatever you want, et cetera, et cetera. So I think what I, you know, the making a movie, it's uh, for me, I mean, I think it's uh, like taking hard drugs. You know, like you take the drugs, you get really high, <laughs> and you're really happy, and then it's finished, and you get down, and you're like, never, ever, I will do that again. <laughs> but then you forget. <laughs> you only remember the moment that you were high, and then you start over. This is how it feels. So that's why I will continue doing it. And do you know what you will be doing next? So. Um, Yes, now I'm preparing an exhibition of painting, but yeah, I have a... You oh, know, yet another incarnation as a painter now. Yes, you know, I mean, you know, the, the thing, Francoise, is that, uh, you know, now I'm 41, and probably, you know, I will have about 30 years, you know, to work really good, you know, the, so... You know, Just say 40, because... No, no, 30. Yeah. You know, if I want to be pragmatic, it's 30. <laughs> and then, <laughs> yeah. like, each project takes about three years for me. Mm -hmm. So three years in 30 years is 10%, mm -hmm. and 10 times 10%, and my life is done. <laughs> so, you know, I have 10 big projects in front of me that I can do. Mm -hmm. So I have to know exactly what I want to do, and not to forget why I do that. Uh, I do it because it's really fun to work. If I consider it as a job, then I have to quit doing that. So if yeah. I think that painting would give me something, I will do it. You know, if I had a career plan of the career, I would certainly not do that. But life is too short. Well, I hope we remain friends and that we can meet again when you're 70 and you're a headhunting detective wearing clothes. <laughs> I hope so too. And I hope that uh, you will enjoy the film and you will enjoy it as much as I enjoy doing it. Thank you very much.